Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on the effects of fire on Sonoran Desert plant communities. I'll be reporting on some work that I did as part of my research dissertation when I did my PhD at Arizona State University. So this project was actually funded by the U.S. Forest Service and specifically the Rocky Mountain Research Station up in Flagstaff, Arizona. So I want to look at uh, this, the study that I did and, and describe to you where I took some of this information or where I um, took some of the data and, and uh, analyzed that data and came up with the information that I have. So I looked at the portion of the Tonto National Forest, which is Sonoran Desert. And uh, so the Tonto National Forest is basically northeast of the Phoenix area, it's about three million acres, and about a third of that, the Tonto National Forest, is Sonoran Desert, uh, specifically the Arizona Upland subdivision of the Sonoran Desert. So that's the part that I'll be talking about. I won't be talking about any, well, as far as the, gather, the data that I gathered won't be on uh, any other part of the Sonoran Desert uh, around Tucson or, or any other area of the Sonoran Desert. So be on the Tonto National Forest, I wanted to explain a little bit about uh, where the Sonoran Desert is and what the Sonoran Desert is. Um, the Sonoran Desert is actually a very diverse uh, desert. There's seven subdivisions of the Sonoran Desert. Um, if you notice in the upper right hand corner of the, of the Sonoran Desert, that's the Arizona Upland subdivision of the Sonoran Desert that I'll be talking about. The Sonoran Desert overall uh, occupies about 275,000 square kilometers, so it's a very big and a very diverse desert. Um, they found that necessary to, um, to divide it and recognize seven subdivisions because of that diversity, the difference in uh, plant growth and types of plants in the Sonoran Desert. So we have the Arizona Upland subdivision that I'll be talking about. The lower Colorado River subdivision is just kind of to the west and then also um, uh, south of the Arizona Upland and it straddles the uh, Gulf of California. So it's on um, both sides of the, the Sea of Cortez. And so the Colorado River subdivision, the Vizcaino uh, subdivision is down on the Baja side. And then you have the Plains of Sonora the Magdalena Plain, which is on both sides of the, um, the Gulf of California, and then as well as the Central Gulf Coast and the foothills of Sonora are also sub subdivisions of the Sonoran Desert. So the Sonoran Desert is, um, the at least the lower Colorado River subdivision is l a lot less diverse than the Arizona Upland subdivision. It consists of mostly creosote bush and, and not a lot of um, cover in the interspaces between creosote bush. So I'll, I'll talk more about the Arizona upland, which is more diverse. Uh, won't talk in any about the other subdivisions. Okay, so um, the Sonoran Desert, the Arizona upland subdivision, uh, at least, and when, most of the Sonoran Desert was, uh, is a fairly recent or a fairly young uh, vegetation type. And so it's really only about 11,000 years old. So uh, we can track the, uh, the type of vegetation that's here now back to about 11,000 years ago. And before that, or prior to this uh, 11,000 years, uh, it was actually a woodland. So over geological time, so over these uh, millions of years, different vegetation types have shifted when we had glacial periods and interglacial periods, then we had changes in vegetation. So you probably hear the term sometimes that uh, vegetation migrates north or, vi or, or migrates south. And what it's actually doing is uh, vegetation will grow further north. Veg vegetation that is adapted to warm plant or warm communities or warm climate will actually uh, grow further north during warm periods and then uh, freeze out and go, grow further south in the cooler periods just because of the warmer or cooler conditions. So that's what happened over evolutionary time during interglacial periods. Uh, 
the Sonoran Desert or those succulent type um, subtropical vegetation species uh, basically migrated north. So our saguaro and those succulent species are, are subtropical plants that have evolved from, from plants that are further uh, closer to the tropics. So what happened then is that as these uh, glacial periods and interglacial periods took place, then uh, the saguaro and the, the succulent plants would move north. And then when it uh, started getting colder, some of these plants would die out. But over that, over that period, that repetition of those kinds of migrations, then um, this uh, a unique uh, plant characteristics started to evolve, so some of those plants became more adapted to cooler conditions, and they evolved and grew right in this Sonoran Desert region. So, anyway, to s summarize all this, you you don't see the same species anywhere else um, that you see in the Sonoran Desert. So the saguaro and the Palo Verde and the Ocotillo are are unique to this area in the Sonoran Desert. Okay, so anyway, um, the other characteristic about the Sonoran Desert is, is that it is not fire adapted. So almost, you know, quite a few of our plant communities have evolved with some fire regime, whether uh, uh, low intensity fires or high, in, high intensity fires, but the Sonoran Desert didn't adapt to fire. And the reason we say this is that uh, the succulent type vegetation just doesn't tolerate fire. So anytime there's fire around Palo Verde and Saguaro and some of the Opuntias, uh, they fire readily kills them really quickly. So they don't they don't tolerate fire at all. And so the other thing that we look at in the Sonoran Desert is that there's inner spaces that are that are bare most of the most of the year. And so uh, they didn't have the fine fuels that it takes for um, for fire to spread from one from one shrub or one plant to the next. So fire didn't spread through the, the Sonoran Desert. Anyway, fire does not uh, didn't evolve, or the plants didn't evolve with fire, and the plants don't like fire, and so it's uh, a unique plant characteristic for that reason. So the problem is is that fire does exist now in the Sonoran Desert, so this is a concern. Uh, when I came to the forest, the Tano National Forest in uh, 1991, I was concerned about fires along the roadways and seeing more and more uh, fires in the Sonoran Desert and wondering if we were losing some of that plant community or if, um, you know, that was something that, you know, it's replenishing itself. So uh, a problem is, is that along these roadways uh, or highways, sometimes these exotic plants were uh, seeded along with highway construction and they are very flammable and they are adapted to fire and so they spread fire in the Sonoran Desert. So along this highway right away, we see this oat grass that's growing and when uh, sparks are generated from a vehicle or a thrown cigarette out the window or however uh, it ignites and it spreads the fire into the Sonoran Desert. So we see um, these kinds of burns along the, uh, the highways in the Sonoran Desert sometimes and uh, the vegetation is scorched. So the problem with that is that now we see these exotic plants spreading more into the Sonoran Desert and we see it, uh, this is the, the river fire that burned and in 2003, so we see uh, a lot more of these, these plants that are, are damaged. So uh, this, a problem with this is that a concern we have is that will these, will these, will these veg vegetation plant communities actually recover? The saguaro that you see kind of in the, the middle of this slide, the, the big saguaro with multiple arms, um, will eventually fail because it was, it was scorched too too much from the fire. And so it's probably, it's more than 200 years old. So you know that uh, once the fire um, burned in this area, a problem is that the uh, some of the exotic plants grow back in this area. And you know that if the uh, red brome especially, if these exotic plants grow back, there's gonna be more fires. The fire regime is going to be increased. In other words, the 
reoccurrence of fire is very likely to, to come before you see another 1200 or an, another 200-year-old uh, saguaro. And even uh, saguaros take, in the wild, like this area, saguaros take up to 50 years to grow even a meter in height. And so with this fire, this area, with the uh, exotic grasses growing back in, especially red brome, uh, we're likely to have a fire before 50 years it takes place. So that's a concern, is will the saguaros ever return to this area? And I'll talk about that a little bit more with my study. So some of the questions that I had was, are the numbers of fires and the land areas burned increasing over time in the Sonoran Desert on the Tano National Forest? And if they are increasing in number and in, in area burned, um, what are the factors involved? What's causing this to take place? And then what are the effects of fire on, on native plant communities? In other words, which plants are really adversely affected and which ones come back quickly. So I, I tried to study both of those areas and get the answer to that. <clears throat> so I looked at some anthropogenic factors. I wanted to see what the human population, um, or I wanted to see what kind of impact humans had or the increased population growth. So I looked at the human population growth in Maricopa County <clears throat> and then I looked at the traffic um, along State Highways 87 and, and then Highway 60. So it, it appeared that a problem is the numbers of vehicles traveling along the road, uh, it, sometimes vehicles burning, sometimes vehicles that have a chain dragging or something that causes sparks um, to ignite the vegetation, sometimes throwing cigarettes. So I knew that was, uh, that was a factor but the best way to measure that uh, would be to maybe measure just the traffic on those, um, those highways. And then other factors, of course, that cause fires is some, uh, some of the wildcat shooting uh, areas that are outside of a shooting range where people go to sight in their uh, rifles. So some of those areas causes, uh, caused fires, and then as well as some uh, campgrounds uh, in some of these areas. So to, to measure that, I just, just measured uh, population growth in Maricopa County, assuming that with increased population growth we would see increased recreation in, in the Sonoran Desert. <clears throat> so in looking at that, I know that uh, I just plotted out uh, population growth in Maricopa County. And so uh, Beginning in 1955, we had uh, the population in Maricopa County was about 500,000 people. And then by uh, 2000, the end of my study, there was more like, it was actually more like 3.8 million people in Maricopa County. So there was a, a big growth of people. Um, urban interface took place, more people were spreading out into the desert, and then more people were going out and camping and, and uh, using their ATVs or recreating in the Sonoran Desert. So there was an increase in population, a very steep increase in population over that time period. I just threw this graph in to show that uh, this is uh, population growth since 1880 and then um, projected population growth past um, 2014. So it was, it's projected that it will continue to grow in Maricopa County. So when I looked at uh, the traffic, um, I actually had uh, got some uh, traffic records from um, the state, and they, they put out uh, traffic counters, and they were able to give me data from each year from 1955 through 2000. So that was um, almost a, a direct relationship with the increase in population in Maricopa County. So. There was a very close um, correlation between uh, the population growth and the amount of traffic. So it, it increased pretty drastically from 1955 to 2000 also. Okay, so those, those two anthropogenic factors plus climatic factors, um, uh, I got data on the climatic factors too. The things that I looked at as far as Climatic factors was the annual precipitation, precipitation that came 
uh, during the 365 days. Then I wanted to look at the time of year and how that affected um, the numbers of fires and the area burned. So I looked at um, winter precipitation, just December, January, and February. Then summer precipitation, June, July, and August. Two winters of precipitation back to back. And then three winters of precipitation back to back. Fall precipitation, spring pre precipitation, and then uh, previous winters and uh, previous summers precipitation. So how did each one of those factors independently affect numbers of fires and the size of the area that's burned? Okay, so to, um, to get information and to see how numbers of fires and the size of fires, I got some records from the Tano National Forest at uh, 45 years of fire reports from the Tonto National Forest in the Sonoran Desert. And then I did a regression analysis just um, with numbers of fires and then acreage of fires with all of those dependent variables, whether the anthropogenic uh, variables, the population or the, the traffic or the, um, um, the climatic data, the, uh, the, the different scenarios as far as precipitation goes. And so then I did the, a, a stepwise regression analysis to see which one of those factors had the most power. So that's how I evaluated uh, what really causes the numbers of fires to increase and the, um, the size of these fires to increase. So, I, so in looking at numbers of fires over time, we know that um, just from this graph, we can see that the numbers of fires increased over time up until about the mid-1980s, or actually the 1980s, and then started to, to kind of taper off a little bit by 2000. So it's just an inter interesting graph to see. Um, I don't fully know all the answers to this. Probably in, in the 1950s, uh, these were some really extreme drought years. And so I expect that this was during a time when there weren't many exotic plants yet. And, uh, and with it being so dry anyway with, uh, for, on the native plants, there probably wasn't a lot for them to burn. So the saguaros and palo verdes were there, but there was probably bare inner spaces in between those plants. And so you probably didn't get very many fires and probably didn't get very many um, large or very many large fires because they weren't, didn't, the vegetation didn't carry these large fires. And then also the population was smaller during that time. <clears throat> during the 1980s though, um, this was a really wet year this is a, a, a really wet decade, actually. And so you had um, the exotic plants showing up, and you had a really, that, that's when population really started to spike as far as um, the human population in Maricopa County. So why did it start to taper off? You can just speculate that maybe it's because people became more aware of uh, the Sonoran Desert and the numbers of fires and uh, more careful with uh, maybe throwing cigarettes out of their campgrounds or, or shooting and that kind of thing. And uh, so maybe that's what caused the, a decline in the numbers of fires up to uh, 2000. So let's look at the anthropogenic effects and how did that actually come out. We know that the numbers of fires increased. When I did my regression analysis, I noted that the numbers of fires increased over time from 1995 or from 1955 to 2000. And then uh, it also, so it, it increased over time. It also increased with uh, population of Maricopa County. So if you just used that factor of population in Maricopa County, fires did increase. The numbers of fires did increase with uh, the population in Maricopa County. And the numbers of fires also increased with vehicular traffic. So there was a direct uh, correlation between those factors. So remember, that's numbers of fires that increased. So if we looked at numbers of hectares burned, um, they, they did not increase with, uh, over, over time. Um, 
So from, two, from 1995 to 2000, the size of fires actually did not increase, although the numbers of fires increased. They did not increase with uh, increased population in Maricopa County and um, did not increase with increased vehicular traffic. So we'll, we'll explain that a little bit, or I'll try to explain that a little bit. As far as climatic effects go, the numbers of hectares burned increased with uh, consecutive multiple winters of precip. So the, the factor that was most important wasn't the total precipitation during the year, but multiple years of precip where we had winters that were fairly wet for more than one year. So I'll explain that a little bit, uh, a little bit later as far as how, why that actually happened in my discussions. But, um, so numbers of fires increased with increased consecutive uh, multiple years of, of winter precipitation also. You expect that the, even if there were small fires, if there was more vegetation, they would probably ignite more easily. But they probably didn't grow very much during wet years, during wet summers, because um, you know the humidity was probably higher. Okay, so anyway, the numbers of fires actually increased with uh, increased multiple winters of precip and then with winter precipitation and with spring precipitation. So here's something that's interesting is that neither the numbers of fires or the numbers of hectares burned increased with increased summer precipitation. So you would expect that to be different in the uh, the timbered uh, country where there would be more summer precipitation, but here with the Everything kind of dries out in the Sonoran Desert, and when uh, during fire season, um, you'd expect that to be during a dry summer, not uh, not a wet summer, because during a wet summer, the humidity is higher, the vegetation um, fuel moisture is higher. Okay, so I'll talk about that a little bit more too, but uh, bring up some other things here. Um, so the major fire months in the Sonoran Desert were. Uh, May, June, and July. So about the same amount, 27% in May, and then June, June had 25% of the fires were in June, and then July, 21% of the fires. So that was uh, just uh, an explanation for that is that you'd have vegetation growing during the winter. So if you had winter precipitation, then you'd have vegetation that would grow that would be flammable. This herbaceous vegetation would be flammable. And then in May, it hardly ever rains in May uh, in the Sonoran Desert in, on the Tano National Forest. So it really dries out. And so that vegetation that grew during the winter dries out in May, and so it's a fuel source. And then uh, that's when they're easily ignited and there's, uh, it burns. So then if it started, uh, that was when you would have a, a good fire year or a big fire year on the uh, in the Sonoran Desert. Now if it started to rain in the summer early then that's when fires would stop. So usually we'd have rains during our monsoon season. Rains would start in July and so July um, in August you'd have fewer Sonoran Desert fires. Okay so these fires um, on, the, on the Sonoran Desert and on the Tano National Forest 75 percent of the fires were person caused. Only 25% lightning caused. It's interesting that um, another study that was done on the Saguaro National Park near Tucson, 95% of their fires were started by lightning, and so only 5% person caused. Of course, the Saguaro National Park is more protected and more regulated, uh, and then uh, they're also doing a pretty good job of controlling invasive species. So that might be the difference there. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, how I conducted a study to determine what the effects of fire is on these Sonoran, these Sonoran Desert plants, specific plants and then plant communities, uh, on, a, on a time since fire gradient. So how long did it take for the plants to recover? So the way I approached this was I measured um, these areas, I measured plants on the, based on their height, their cover, the, the ground cover and canopy cover, and then density, so the number of plants per unit area. So I looked at uh, a gradient of fire, so I wanted to see 
um, fires that were recent, as recent as five years, and then as old, or the time since fire, as long as 21 years. So I had uh, the River Fire, which was five years of time since fire. The Vista Fire was seven years of time since fire. The Bush Highway Fire, which had actually some repeated burns. And then the Massacre Fire was 17 years of time since fire. And the Siphon Fire was 21 years of time since fire. So that gave me an opportunity to see how fast do these uh, specific, the individual plants recover and how fast does uh, the plant community start to um, get back to the same density or the same cover. Okay, so to do that, we measured, um, I looked at uh, a burned area and then an adjacent area with the same type of plant community that was unburned. So I had five plots in each of these fires of burned and unburned uh, plots. And then, uh, so, so that way I could compare what had burned and then I used the unburned as a control plot. <clears throat> I measured density and I measured cover uh, of all the plants, uh, the saguaro as well as the herbaceous plants. So as far as results go, the total cover increased as time since fire increased. Uh, so you would expect that. The total density decreased slightly as time since fire increased. So if you wonder about that, it's just what happens is the after fire, the smaller plants start to grow. So there's numerous small plants that grow. And then as the plant community starts to mature, the larger plants start to grow and they actually shade out the smaller plants. So there's more cover of the larger plants as time since fire increases and there's fewer of the small plants. So that's, uh, that explains why that, um, the total density decreased slightly as, as time since fire increased. Here's the, a list of plants that and how they responded with fire. Um, so the, as far as the plants that decreased with fire, the saguaro, of course, we would expect that. The saguaro decreased. In fact, that's the plant that we have the most concern about and maybe second most concern about is Palo Verde, which is often a nurse plant to the saguaro. But these fires uh, decreased with, with fire. The saguaro, Palo Verde, banana yucca, bursage, white ratney, prickly pear, wolfberry, and jojoba. And the fire, the um, plants that increased with fire are desert senna, uh, purple threon, which is a grass, and uh, brittle bush, uh, prickly pear. The reason I have prickly pear asterisks in, in, both, in both columns is prickly pear seem to be very susceptible to fire, and so it would die out quickly with fire. But it's al also returned to those plant communities fairly quickly. So you would see in the fires that had more time since fire, you would actually see more prickly pear. Uh, they may be even more dense than they were before the fire. Um, so a couple of others as, as desert rock pea and then false mesquite. Jojoba is another one that's kind of interesting. In my studies, I saw a decrease of fire, uh, with fire. Um, other studies have shown that jojoba actually responded pretty well and grew back and so it was sort of a fire adapted species or more fire adapted than some of the other species. The reason I think it was different in my study is these fires were probably more intense than most desert fires. They were really hot and so it was difficult for a jojoba to come back and become established. Okay. So let's look at uh, cover response uh, to time since fire. I plotted on this graph uh, the uh, fire gradients, so the river fire being the most recent and the siphon fire being the oldest fire, 21 years, and then tried to plot um, the difference between the control plots, the unburned plots, and the burn plots to see um, how fast or how uh, how much time it's taken for these burn plots to recover. So this gives me a kind of an indication of that. The, uh, the y-axis is the percent cover. 
And so you can see by these two lines on this graph that they become closer together as time since fire increase. So on the far right side of the, uh, the graph, you can see the lines are closer together. So that tells me that there is some recovery as far as cover is concerned uh, by these uh, increased cover in the burn plots. Okay, so a big concern about fire in the Sonoran Desert is saguaro. Uh, I didn't, at the time, I didn't find any studies that showed a very significant recovery of saguaro after fire. So a, a lot of that was because once an area burned in the Sonoran Desert, uh, the Arizona upland subdivision especially, then there, there's usually, there was high likelihood that um, it would burn again before you know, the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And so if that happens, then the small saguaros just, they uh, wouldn't survive. Because even the, the really small saguaros um, couldn't even tolerate fire less than the larger saguaros. And they, uh, they grow really slowly when they're small. They don't grow up fast and then uh, slow down with growth. They actually start out growing really slow and then uh, the growth, uh, the rate of growth starts to increase. But I did find there was some recovery of saguaro on the siphon fire, the 21 years of time since fire. And this uh, photograph shows an area on, on the siphon fire. You can see that, you can see some of the small saguaros in this photo that they, uh, they're, some of them are maybe six to 10 inches in height um, or six tenths, uh, less than six tenths of a, a meter in height. So to study this, I looked at the, these height categories. Um, I categorized the saguaros that were six tenths or smaller, uh, six, six tenths of a meter or smaller, and I categorized, that, categorized those as juvenile saguaros, and then the mature saguaros were larger than three meters in height. So if you look at these, this, gra this table, you can see that um, in the control plot, the unburned plot, there was very there were many uh, smaller juvenile saguaros. It was eight in the in the the juvenile category, and there was 56 mature saguaros in that control plot, the unburned plot. And just the kind of the opposite, there's only half that many mature saguaros in the burn plot. So that tells you that probably half of them were burned. And, uh, and so there was uh, three times as many, more than three times as many uh, small saguaros. So the juvenile saguaros, uh, of the juvenile saguaros, there was 32. And so uh, that tells you that some of those plants had to have um, germinated since the fire and they are uh, st starting to grow. So, so I drew the conclusion that there is some recovery, at least in that plant community. Okay, so uh, as far as um, conclusions go, uh, we know that the, the numbers of ignitions increased with increased anthropogenic activities. So that meant that there's, uh, there were more fires. The area burned increased during the uh, spring seasons preceded by two or three wet winters. And so what was happening during these wet winters is that during the first wet winter, uh, the red brome was starting to grow, hadn't produced a lot of seed yet, so it wasn't, the biomass wasn't as high as it could be. But during the second wet winter, uh, the, uh, the plants produced lots of seeds the first winter, and by the second winter, there's lots of seeds in the ground, and so the the red brome really started to produce. So that was a biomass producing year, the second winter. So during that second winter then, it provided lots of fuel for the uh, fires to occur in the Sonoran Desert. And, it, and as I said before, uh, annuals die um, out after they uh, mature. And during the, uh, the month of May, when it's typically very, very dry, they really dried out and became a real fuel source. So that directly caused an increase in the size of the fires in the Sonoran Desert. Okay, um, so um, as, I, 
stated before, red brome is not necessarily uh, a drought adapted species. It needs its precipitation during the winter, so it needs this uh, two or three years of precipitation during the winter back to back. Okay, so uh, there were some of the other years that we had a uh, wet, a wet fall or, or, or somewhat wet winter, but uh, only a single wet winter where we had a production of native vegetation, a good production of native vegetation, but not very much red brome. And it seems like those years in 2001 and then in 1998 were years where we didn't have very many fires. Okay, so um, the numbers of fires were influenced by human population growth, traffic, and uh, winter precipitation on the Tano National Forest during the, the past 45 years. However, the numbers of hectares burned was influenced only by the consecutive multiple winters of precipitation. So I wanted to bring up a few things as far as uh, maybe research that's needed in the future um, to deal with or to restore Sonoran Desert plant communities after fire and um, some, some information that's needed. So can we answer the question, how can uh, fire management be approached and protect the uh, Sonoran Desert vegetation? So how, um, how can we actually focus on these, these areas that are vulnerable to fire during years when we've had multiple winters of precipitation, maybe uh, focus fire suppression in the desert during those years. Um, so that's a question that could be answered. And then uh, how can fire adapted invasive species be controlled? So how can the red brome in those, uh, those species that um, were introduced from either another continent um, or another vegetation type and they're really aggressive in the Sonoran Desert, how can we actually start to control those plants? And then um, how can these native plant communities be restored? So how can we, after the, uh, the Sonoran Desert has been, fire, uh, been burned, how do we go back and try to restore those native plants? So thank you very much.